Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. The book of Ruth begins with this sentence, in the days when the judges ruled, but if you are not very familiar with the Old Testament, this does not mean very much to you. So uh, allow me to explain. About 400 years before this point in history, Moses had led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He led them across the Red Sea into the wilderness uh, where they lived until Moses died. Uh, And then a man named Joshua led the people into the land of Canaan that God had promised to Abraham. Uh, And you can read that whole story in the book of Joshua. Uh, And then after Joshua died, in the day, the days of the judges began. Uh, And you can read that story in the book of Judges. Uh, It's the book just before the book of Ruth. And the book of Judges is like a nightmare that just keeps getting worse and worse. The people keep wandering away from God and worshiping idols. Uh, Then God allows their enemies to conquer them and enslave them until finally they wake up and realize, oh, we really need the true God after all. Uh, Then God would send them a Messiah, uh, usually a warrior who would go to war against God's enemies, against the people's enemies. He would win and then give the people peace for at least one generation. And they called these messiahs judges. Uh, Some of the most famous judges were names like Deborah, Gideon, Samson. But then the next generation would forget. They would wander away from God, and the whole process would begin again, except even worse. And this went on for about 350 years until the book of Judges actually ends with a terrible civil war. So when the writer of the book of Ruth begins here by saying, during the time when the judges ruled, his readers would immediately get the shivers. Because the original readers of this book lived a few hundred years later, after the book of Ruth, during the time of the kings when the nation was much more stable and prosperous. So to them, starting the story like this would be like saying, once upon a time in the bad old days, before we had a king to unite and protect us. Okay, so uh, in Malaysia, we might say, once upon a time in the days when Umno ruled, you know, something like that. But the writer then goes on to, to add some information. He says, there was a famine in the land. And this second sentence is actually worse than the first sentence, because the original readers would remember, uh, they would remember this time, they would remember their scriptures, and they would think back to certain warnings that Moses gave them. If you do not obey the Lord your God, and do not carefully follow all his commands, The sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you iron. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder, and there will be famine. So when the writer says here there was a famine in the land, his readers would immediately know that this story begins during one of the bad parts of the book of Judges. The land is under God's curse right now because the people are not being faithful. 
Well, then the writer goes on to make it even worse. He says, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. And again, the original readers would immediately remember their history, right? They would remember that about 700 years before this, 800 years before this, God told Abraham to go to the promised land, and Abraham obeyed until a famine came along. And then he left and moved to Egypt, where terrible things happened to him. Uh, and they would also remember Jacob, Abraham's grandson, who lived obediently in the promised land until a famine came along. And then the whole family moved to Egypt, where they became slaves for 400 years. So when the writer says this certain man moved to a foreign country to escape a famine, his readers would think, oh man, something bad is going to happen for sure. And then the writer goes on to give his readers one more important piece of information. In verse 2, he says the man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Benjamin, from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and they lived there. So this family is an Ephrathite family from Bethlehem. Now, this name means nothing to us, but the original readers would have said, oh, the Ephrathites, a very well-connected family, a rich family, direct descendants from Judah, their ancestor, the, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. So what we're seeing here is this is the same old story. When trouble comes to their own country, the rich families fly away to greener pastures, to another country. And so now the original readers would be rolling their eyes. They would be saying, oh, they're Ephrathites. So that makes sense. Of course, they're running away from their problems. They're rich, aren't they? And sure enough, our, our readers are right. Something bad does happen to them. Now, Elimelech, it says in verse 3, Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. And that makes sense, right? If God tells you, this is your land, stay and take care of your land no matter what, then it's a bad idea to disobey. When your father says, don't do that or I will have to discipline you, then don't do that. Because God has a, has a habit of keeping his promises. And God also has a habit of being merciful. So the, the days when the judges ruled were, were really terrible because God had to keep disciplining his people for their disobedience. But the original readers would also have known that, that God's discipline is always designed to turn people back to himself, to lead them to repentance. So now that Elimelech, the father, has died, the question we have to ask is, will Naomi and, and her sons get the message? Are they going to repent and go back home where they belong? Well, the answer is no. Instead, verse 4, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And by this point in the story, the, the original readers are tired already. It's like watching one of those horror movies where the characters always make the wrong decision. And so eventually you stop giving them advice and you just say, okay, so Dada. Because the thing is, God's law was pretty clear about this also. Do not intermarry with pagan women. They will lead you away to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. But here... Naomi's sons have married pagan Moabite women. So what is going to happen to them? Well, after they had lived there about 10 years, both Mahlon and Kilion died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Okay then. But the good news is that was just the introduction. Okay, that was just the backstory, the setup for the real story. That was like the Star Wars prequels. They're terrifying, 
horrible. You never want to see them again, but, uh, but now you're ready for the real story to begin. And the real story in this case is about this old woman, Naomi, a widow left completely alone in a foreign country. She was part of a rich family. Now she has nothing. And the real story centers around this question. What hope does she have now? Where can she look for salvation now that God has turned against her? So this is a story about the powerless. This is a story about those who have lost everything, perhaps through disobedience, perhaps through the disobedience of the people around them, perhaps for no apparent reason at all. This is a story that asks the questions that every one of us have asked at some point in our lives. Why is this happening to me? Have I screwed up somehow? Has God turned against me? This story was written to answer those questions. So let's get started. So the real story begins in verse 6, when this widow Naomi hears that the famine in her homeland is finally over. The people have repented, they have cried out to God, they have returned to his care, and he is caring for them. So she decides that, all, all things being equal, she would rather eat in her own home country than in a foreign one. So she packs up and gets on the road, and her daughters-in-law come along. Why? Well, they were family for 10 years at least, and apparently these young women have some affection for their mother-in-law. But before they get too far down the road, Naomi tells them, look, really, you should stay here in Moab. Right, go back, find new husbands. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. But I don't really need you to come along. And then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud. And they said to her, we will go back with you to your people. So Naomi tries again in verse 11. She says, no, really, you need to go home. If you follow me to Israel, you will just, you'll have just about a zero chance of finding new husbands. And why does she say this? Well, because good Jewish boys are not going to marry pagan foreign girls, are they? Naomi's own sons were not really very good Jewish boys. And even if Naomi found a new husband and had a new set of sons so that they could grow up to be bad Jewish boys and, and marry these pagan girls, well, it's just not going to work, is it? But Naomi is too old to have more sons. And even if she were young enough, it would take another 20 years for this plan to work. And, and that's why Naomi says in verse 13, would you wait till my sons grew up, my second batch? I mean, would you remain unmarried for them? Of course not. So she says, no, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. She is saying, God has turned against me. And if you follow me, God is going to turn against you too. So go home. Then Orpah decides to go back, but Ruth refuses. In verse 16, she says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death separates you from me. Now, these verses are among some of the most beautiful ever written. Now, what a promise. What a vow. I mean, what a covenant Ruth makes with Naomi here. Naomi has nothing to offer Ruth. No money, no husband, no status, no future. But this pagan young woman says, I don't care. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Now, people ask sometimes, so did Ruth convert here? Did she stop being pagan and start being a, a monotheist, a Jewish person at this point? Well, no. And yes, 
it depends on what you mean by convert. Uh, a lot of us modern Christians, when when we say conversion, we're, we're, we we think of a, a kind of a spiritualized, emotional kind of thing based on belief in certain doctrines about God. And, and this idea comes generally from our Western friends uh, who put a great deal of weight on the concept of individual personal belief. But that's not what Ruth is going through here. We don't know what she understands about the nature of the Jewish God. Probably her theological understanding is very limited. So she is not converting in, in our modern sense. However, she is converting in the biblical sense. See, conversion in the Bible is not simply a matter of belief or understanding. Biblical conversion means moving from a place outside of God's people to a place within God's people. It's a change of loyalty. It's, it's a change of identification. So up until this moment, Ruth would have introduced herself as Ruth of Moab, a worshiper of Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. But now, through this vow, she has changed her home, her ethnicity, and her religion. She is now Ruth of Bethlehem, a worshiper of Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. And does she really understand everything that this means? Not yet. But she has committed herself to figuring it out. And she has just said so in very strong language and beautiful language. So, in verse 18, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Now, this is an, an uncomfortable verse, actually, because literally in, in Hebrew, this sentence says that Naomi stopped talking to her. So Ruth makes this beautiful covenant vow of faithfulness, and in return, Naomi gives her the silent treatment. Now, what is Naomi doing? Back in verse 9, she said, May the Lord show you kindness as you go back to your people and your gods. But now that Ruth has said, No, no, I love you so much that I'm, I'm going to leave my gods and, and come and join your God. <laughs> now Naomi speaks no blessing at all. So what is wrong with this woman? You'd think she'd be happy to have some company on the road. You'd think she'd be happy to have someone standing by her but she's not. Why not? Well, we don't know exactly. Maybe Ruth is just a painful reminder of how much she has lost. Uh, maybe Naomi is ashamed. Uh, maybe she doesn't want to go back home and have to explain to her old friends that Ruth is her son's pagan widow, the woman he never should have married in the first place. And this whole thing is ironic. When Naomi spoke that blessing to her daughters-in-law, may the Lord show you kindness, she was using covenant language, actually. That, that word kindness in, in English, is, 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 it's just a nice word. But in Hebrew, the word Naomi uses means so much more than just kindness. It's a word that in other places is, is translated as everlasting love, covenant love, the kind of love that can never be taken away no matter what happens. So what we're seeing here is that, that Naomi knows the words. She has the, the theological concepts in her head. She is properly converted in our modern sense. She, she believes all the right doctrines about God, but her heart is hard. Ruth, by contrast, really gets it. She, she feels compassion from a soft heart, even though she does not yet know all the right covenant words and, and theology and stuff. And she understands that covenant love means covenant faithfulness. It means you give up everything for the sake of someone else. Verse 19, so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women explained, can this be Naomi? Her old friends can hardly recognize her. 
She's been gone so long. She went away with a husband and two boys, enough money saved up to migrate to a new country and start a new life. And now here she is back, old, worn out, with nothing left. And at this point, Naomi finally bursts, bursts out. She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. See, Naomi's name means pleasant in Hebrew. So when the women meet her, they, they're saying, wow, can this be the pleasant one? And she can't take it anymore. She says, don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me Mara, the bitter one. Now, why? She says it's because the Almighty has made her life very bitter. And we should notice, by the way, that she changes her name for God here. Until now in the story, she has always called God the Lord, which is Yahweh in Hebrew. This is God's covenant name, the name he uses when he is dealing with his people out of a covenant love. But here, she calls him the Almighty, which is Shaddai in Hebrew. Now, Shaddai means the judge, the king of all the gods. And, and we see here in these verses that he sw she, sw she switches back and forth. In one minute, she calls him Shaddai, the judge, and then she calls him Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. And, and then she switches back to Shaddai, the Almighty, the judge. We can see that she is frustrated and confused. Does God love me or does God hate me? Is he supposed to destroy me for my sins? Or is he supposed to have mercy? I think we all know what that feels like. Verse 22, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And with this last line, the writer finally turns to some really good news. He, he shows us that the famine is really over. It, it's springtime in Israel, April or May in our, in our calendar, and, and the barley harvest is beginning God's people really have repented and returned to God's care. And God really is the covenant God who loves his people, and who's going to provide for his people, no matter what they have done in the past. So we see that even though Naomi is frustrated and bitter and confused about who God really is, this does not change the reality of who God really is. Naomi's confusion is not God's confusion. The people were confused about who the true God is, but, but now they're back and they're being cared for. Well, Naomi is still confused about who the true God really is, but now she's back in body, at least, if not in spirit yet. Is God going to take care of her, even though she doesn't yet really understand well, the people were confused about the, who, who the true God is. Now, now they're back and being cared for. Naomi is still confused about who the true God really is, and, but now she's back. Is she going to be cared for? Well, in other words here, Naomi wants to know, who is God, really? Is he Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God who loves his people with an everlasting love? Or is he Shaddai, the judge, the disciplinarian? What hope does Naomi have now? Where, where can she look for salvation? Has God turned against her or not? Well, this story, the book of Ruth actually was written to answer these questions. So let's look back over this chapter now and, and see if this God is Shaddai, the judge, or Yahweh, the merciful covenant keeper. Which God are we dealing with here? So Elimelech, the husband, is disobedient. he's disobedient. He moves his family away from God's covenant country, and he dies. 
His sons are disobedient. They marry women outside of God's covenant people, and they die. So this does look like the work of Shaddai, the king of the gods who rules with a rod of iron. God does not look very merciful here. And we know, actually, I think many of you know that this is what many people think about the God of the Old Testament. They read these stories and they say, I'm sorry, I just cannot worship a harsh, unforgiving, judgmental God like this. And, and that's a problem for us, isn't it? Because truthfully speaking, we as Christians, we would we'd, honestly, we'd say the same. Right? If we believed God was nothing but harsh and judgmental, we wouldn't worship him either. So how are we supposed to answer our friends when, when they say things like this? Well, first, we can point out that every God is harsh, unforgiving, and judgmental. Uh, even modern secular gods are harsh, unforgiving, and judgmental. In fact, modern secular gods are more judgmental than the old kind. Uh, our modern gods are things like political theory, economic theory, environmentalism. You know, these systems are absolutely unforgiving. The overwhelming message of our modern science is, if you do not follow the rules, you will get smashed. Your economies will crash. Your governments will fall apart. Death will come to you if you do not obey our commands. So the first thing we can point out to our friends is that despite their best efforts, they already worship harsh, unforgiving, and judgmental gods. Actions have consequences, and the gods enforce that. But second, we can point out that our God the God of the Christian Bible, is the only exception to this rule. Yes, he is Shaddai, the judge, but he is also Yahweh, the compassionate, covenant-keeping God. He is the only God in any scripture, anywhere in the world, who promises to love his people with an everlasting love. When God is dealing with his people outside of his, when he's dealing with people outside of his covenant, he is Shaddai, pure and simple. His judgment falls, consequences follow action, and, and that's the end of the story. But when he is dealing with his covenant people, he is Yahweh. He is still Shaddai, the judge, but now his judgment serves and saves his covenant relationships. It actually protects his people from the consequences of their actions and their sins. But still, you know, our friends could point to Naomi's story here and say, well, explain this. How was Naomi protected from the consequences of her actions here? How, how is losing her whole family merciful? Here's how we can answer. As a thought experiment, let's pretend to be God and turn this story around. Okay, let's pretend that Elimelech lives. He becomes more and more prosperous. His sons marry pagan women, and they have lots of kids, and they all become more and more prosperous. Now, what is the inevitable end of that kind of story? Will they ever leave Moab? Probably not. Why leave a country that is making them rich? Will Naomi's grandchildren and great-grandchildren be worshipers of the true God? Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God? Probably not. At the very best, they'll be confused, but at the very worst, they will be worshipers of Shemosh, who was a purely Shaddai kind of judge, kind of God, without the Yahweh part. Shemosh means destroyer. And he was a God who demanded child sacrifice, infants roasted alive. And this is what would have happened to Naomi's grandchildren and great-grandchildren if, if her husband and her sons had lived and prospered. So yes, the death of her family was a mercy. I mean, we think of death as the worst kind of judgment that can fall on a person, but friends, that is not true. 
Sometimes death is a mercy. Sometimes death is what saves us and our children from even more terrible things. Elimelech and his sons disobeyed and they persisted in their disobedience and they paid for it with their lives. And if God had not shown them the mercy of death, Naomi would never have returned to Israel, the land of promise, the land of the covenant. If God had not stripped Naomi of everything she treasured, she would have lived to see infant members of her family sacrificed to the destroyer in the most horrible ways imaginable. So we see here that, that God is Shaddai, the judge, but for those within his covenant, he is also Yahweh, the God of everlasting love, the God who never demands that we sacrifice our children, the God who gives up his own son so that we do not have to give up ours. Salvation does not always look the way we think it should. But we have to remember, even in death, God's people are not beyond his reach. But of course, we are all like Naomi, aren't we? Disappointment and grief come to us, and suddenly we doubt God's character. We get frustrated and confused. And so, ironically, when misfortune comes to us, not only do we forget God's true character, but our own true character is revealed. It's easy to be Naomi, right? It's easy to be the pleasant one when everything is going great. But when things fall apart, that's when the real me comes out. Naomi went away pleasant because she thought she was rich. But after she lost everything, the truth came out. She is not actually pleasant at all. She ends up giving the silent treatment to the last faithful person in her, in her life. She, she arrives home and she won't even acknowledge that Ruth is with her. She tells her friends, the Lord has brought me back empty. We are all just like Naomi, aren't we? And that means that the central question of the book of Ruth is also the central question for us. The writer of the book of Ruth wants us to be asking, what hope does this old widow have now? Where can she look for salvation now that it looks like God is out to get her? And it's the same question we should be asking ourselves. What hope do we have? Where can we look for salvation when it feels like God is out to get us? And I have to tell you, that as a preacher, that there's always this temptation at this point in the sermon to take a shortcut and tell you to save yourselves. The temptation for me is to say, just believe. Just have faith. Just repent and everything will be great. Or, try this one on, don't be bitter like Naomi. Right? Be faithful like Ruth. Then God will stop being Shaddai and will start becoming Yahweh to you. And that advice sounds great, right? It sounds very affirming and self-actualizing and, and positive thinking and all that sort of thing. And young people and, and rich people and strong people love that sort of application because they still don't know that actually they're already empty. Right? And that's the sort of sermon Naomi loved to hear back when she had money and a husband and two sons, when she was empowered and strong. But for those of us who have been emptied by the mercy of God, for those of us to whom God has revealed the terrible truth about our, our, our help, helplessness, well, we know that kind of sermon, that kind of application just doesn't work, don't we? Often, our experience is just like Naomi's. God finally catches up to us in our disobedience. We finally surrender, and we come dragging back into Christian community. And then we look around, and, and in all honesty, we have to say, well, here I am. 
I've repented, but this still sucks. Sometimes our war against God goes on so long that by the time we give up, we have nothing left to live on. We spend everything we have running away from him. And by the time we come to our senses and turn around, we realize we have nothing left for the road home. We repent, but we're still at the bottom of everything, still powerless to rebuild our lives. We can't be faithful and pleasant like Ruth. We don't have the strength to pretend anymore. So where are we to look for salvation when it seems as if God has turned against us? If we are no longer strong enough to just have faith, what are we supposed to do? Well, to answer that question for ourselves, we have to first answer Naomi's question. Where is she to look for salvation now that it looks like God has turned against her? Or to ask that question in a slightly different way, where is Naomi's Messiah? Where is Naomi's Savior? Well, I don't want to spoil the rest of the book of Ruth for those of you who have not read it, but I will give you a hint. God has already given Naomi a Messiah. This Messiah has been with Naomi for at least 10 years. Uh, This Messiah has suffered alongside her through every bitter blow. This Messiah has made an everlasting covenant with her. So, where is Naomi's Savior? Right there, at her side. And all she has to do is look. But here is the ironic twist. Naomi cannot look to this Messiah because she cannot see yet. She has been blinded by her own bitterness. Salvation is right there, available to her, but she can't even see it. So what can she do? Well, the answer is nothing. She is going to have to wait for God to reveal his salvation to her. She's going to have to wait for God to open her eyes to see her Messiah and see his true nature. She is going to have to live in bitterness until God chooses the time of redemption. The answer then is, is the same for us. Where are we to look for salvation when it looks like God is out to get us? Who is our Savior, our Messiah? Well, God has already given us a Messiah, Jesus, his Son. Our Messiah has been with us for years. He has suffered alongside us through every bitter blow. He has made an everlasting covenant with us. So where is our Savior? Right here with us. And all we have to do is look. But I think many of us have experienced times that are so bitter, so dark, that we are helpless even to look. We find ourselves powerless even to pray. Well-meaning Christians tell us, just believe, just pray harder. But we can't because we have nothing left. And that kind of advice just just makes us doubt our own salvation even more. And this is where the true character of God makes all the difference. If our God were nothing more than Shaddai, the judge, the Almighty, then, then the burden is on us to pray more, to work harder, to make sure we make him happy. And then, when we have nothing left to spend, judgment day. But because our God is Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, He comes to us when we are unable to come to Him. He reaches into the darkness, into foreign lands, to save those who belong to Him. He is the God who saves those who have nothing left to give. So, practically speaking now, what 
is our application. And, um, uh, what are we supposed to believe? What are we supposed to do because of what we've read here today? Well, if you're here today and you are a baptized believer, but you are living in active rebellion against God, then believe this. God has bound himself to you by an everlasting covenant, which means that no matter how far you run, he will always send his Messiah after you to bring you home, sometimes at terrible cost. And so if the Spirit moves you to believe this today, then do this in response. Give up quickly. Repent quickly. Because I promise you, you are going to run out of resources long before God does. He is going to win you in the end, so give in while you still have something left. Now, if you're here today and you are a baptized believer and you are living in obedience with God, then, but it still feels like he has stripped you of every ambition, every resource, every source of joy, if you feel completely helpless, if you feel powerless even to pray, then believe this. God has already provided you with a Savior. I know you can't see him right now, but it's true. And so believing this, then do this in response. Wait for him in the darkness. Do your best not to beat yourself up because our God is Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, and he will lift you up in his perfect time. And finally, if, if you're here today and, and you do not believe, if you are not baptized, then believe this. You are not yet in covenant with Yahweh you are still under the power of Shemosh, the destroyer. God is still only Shaddai to you, the king of the gods who rules with a rod of iron. So if that is you, then do this in response. Repent and be baptized and discover the true nature of God. Maybe you have doubts. Maybe you're one of those who says, I, I could never worship a harsh, unforgiving, judgmental God. Well, if that's true, then prove it. Stop living under the power of harsh, unforgiving, judgmental gods that rule this world. Enter into covenant with the only God who is not harsh, unforgiving, and judgmental. Bind yourself to him in baptism and you will find that he has bound himself to you in everlasting covenant. You will see him transformed in your sight from Shaddai, the judge, to Yahweh, the God of everlasting, merciful love. In closing then, let me say this. Misfortune comes to us all, especially now during a global pandemic now, sometimes God allows misfortune to come to us because we are living in disobedience and he wants to guide us back to himself, back to repentance. That is mercy. Sometimes God allows misfortune to come to us because there is something about ourselves that he wants us to learn. That too is mercy. But sometimes God allows misfortune to come to us for reasons of his own as part of a larger plan that we cannot yet comprehend. And this is hard. But because our God is Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, we are able to say, as, as Paul does in the New Testament, God works all things together for the good of those who love him. So when misfortune comes, friends, if you need to repent, repent. If you need to cry out to blame God, do that. If you need to wait in the darkness, then do that. And above all, fix in your mind that our God is the God who keeps faith with his people. And when you see a brother or sister in trouble, don't tell them to save themselves. 
Tell them they are already saved. Preach the gospel of Yahweh to them. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ.